I went hunting when I was young with my grandfather and he lit some fires on our way back and uh, he said that the uh, forest was too dense and not enough food for the deer and, and so as we walked back we he, I saw the big cloud of fire with the, the aircraft trying to put it out and he said oh I wish they would just leave it it's just doing good it's not doing anything bad. Well, I think as Indigenous people are more part of the land, like we, we live in it and uh, we interact with, you know, our surroundings much more so than urban people. For myself, uh, as an example, I, I was born and raised in Gift Lake, Métis Settlement, and I, uh, my dad was a, a hunter, trapper, fisherman, uh, logger, also a, a wildland firefighter. So I was always, you know, living in uh, in the bush on land and it uh, becomes a natural progression to get into protecting uh, the land and the forest and, uh, and the people. Fire was a part of our everyday life and nowadays it's not. So peop when people see fire they just feel fear and scared. People have forgotten how fire works, how fire behaves, the dangers of fire, but also the utility of fire. And so I think a part of prescribed burning is bringing that knowledge back to people. With modern firefighting or wildfire management, pretty much all of our resources and all our actions are geared towards reacting to fires. Uh, you know, it's a bigger budget for helicopters or crews and the newest technology, and none of that really makes a difference. With Indigenous fire management, so much of what is done is to take care of the land in such a way that large fires are prevented. and when they do occur, they are manageable. Like bringing fire back into the landscape, you know, there's obviously, um, there's a lot of effort that's put into fire suppression. Uh, I call that the industrial fire complex. You know, it's a big industry, billions of dollars spent on, on suppression, but it's not sustainable. There's a lot of resistance to this kind of motivation, right? To be able to have this uh, opportunity for Indigenous people and others to partner with us uh, to be able to put fire back into these places. And that's because of the industrial fire complex, right? So you've got people whose, whose livelihoods are based on this new economy that's based on fire suppression, who resist this idea of Indigenous fire. You know, how many people do you put out on a wildfire? How many lives do you put online? How much equipment is involved? Simply because, you know, there's, there's big money to be made and by having this you know, easier solution that's much more cost effective, it's a threat to that, that way of life. So when we talk about putting fire back on the land, um, we, we can have this sort of this gap or this disconnection where historically fire happened frequently and generally it was people doing that. But as you remove the people and their practices from the land, or if you maybe just have a natural change in the fire regime, that's possible too. Um, fuel can build back up, so your forests are going to fill back in, young trees establish, they begin to grow, and they increase the continuity of that fuel. So you maybe had this beautiful open stand, very few trees, very sparse, a nice low flammability environment, but as fire suppression or colonization have changed that, you can have forests filling back in, more what we call ladder fuels, so trees and shrubs that are quite short that can conduct fire up into the canopy to create those really big, high risk, uh, very dangerous crown fires. So when we talk about bringing fire back to the land, you can restore that cycle where you're having frequent fire, which kills that uh, those younger trees, that understory vegetation, removes fuel, so it maybe even may convert to a grassland, and that may be an intentional thing that was that was practiced. And so you're reducing the, the fuel that's in the area and thereby reducing the risk. So when we have more frequent fire, we can maintain these lower flammability landscapes and that uh, restoration really allows us to reduce fire risk because that returning of fire uh, eliminates some of those problematic fuel structures that we're really concerned about. So Métis people used fire for a lot of reasons and the most common thing that you hear from elders is to clean up the land. So, you know, as the forest grows, you know, things die and go on the forest floor and it makes it hard for animals to move around and for grass to grow. In the north, poplar and aspen trees start to encroach on meadows that deer and other ungulates rely on that we use for our hunting. 
So with fire, by putting fire on the landscape, you can basically create environments or create biodiversity on the land, which is really important to our communities and being able to survive in the areas that we're in. So, you know, instead of having to go 300 kilometers to find a moose, you can bring the moose to you by using fire. With the advent of kind of colonial fire management that's been geared towards suppressing pretty much all fires and then indigenous and fires, uh, what you have now is, if you can imagine the boreal forest as an ocean of trees. Um, and in this ocean, when a fire comes through, it's like a tidal wave that just continues to gain energy. And if that ocean is just unbroken trees, that tidal wave eventually gains enough energy that it becomes unstoppable. With traditional fire management, you would be maintaining the land in such a way that you'd create what's called a land mosaic. So you'd burn over here one year for uh, muskrat trapping, and then you'd burn over here for the next year to create a meadow, et cetera, et cetera. And what you would create is a landscape mosaic where you have these little pockets throughout the boreal forest that had burned at different times and then weren't going to burn for a long time again. There have been so many cases where science has said, oh, we shouldn't put fire into these different places because there are rare ecosystems or there's rare species that are found there. And all my life what I've seen is that the reason why those things are rare is because we're not putting fire into them. And so um, in, in a lot of the places that I've been able to put fire, it's been able to demonstrate that, oh yeah, these rare species do come back because of this, this cycle of fire. And fire really is a keystone process within those places. So, um, and people, uh, our indigenous fires are, the, are the, the ways that that fire typically takes place. Indigenous knowledge is basically one of the oldest forms of science. You've got to ask yourself, what is science? Uh, science is how we interpret what's happening in the world around us and then communicate that to those that we may not speak the same language of. And I think about traditional knowledge and science, and they are the same thing. Science isn't anything new. Science is something that we've been doing since, you know, we didn't even have history. Science is trial and error and learning and passing down knowledge. And traditional knowledge is a science. Oral tradition is a science. These two things are not different. We've just taken science and knowledge and we've put it in the ivory tower of academia or put it behind different barriers and walls so that we can attribute a value to it. But Science only has value in its application, and I think that's the beauty of traditional knowledge. It's science applied, and it's science applied for living and health and for communities. I work with communities uh, doing fire smart programs, and we, that's kind of uh, the basis of it is to try to uh, not so much stop a wildfire, but to kind of slow it down as it approaches a, a, a community. So. When I was a child, like we used to do that every spring, we'd burn off the grass and dead debris around around a yard. So it, it's very effective because, like I said, it, it uh, it'll slow down the progression of fire. Like if it's moving through your area, it doesn't matter if it's your home or if it's your camp. Um, and it's been proven, like over time, that uh, you'll see some places where, uh, like you have uh, this camp encampment. And if a fire comes over, like a lot of the stuff that's in, at the camp, if it's cleared up properly, it, it stays and uh, the rest of it gets burnt over. So it's, uh, it, is, it is effective. I think what's important to me is like bringing back the cultural practice around fire and that relationship. So right now we're really focused on this Western style of fire suppression. You know, when fires occur on the landscape, putting them out. but. I think the real important thing is bringing back the Métis relationship with fire and the, the cultural connection to fire. So many of our elders believe that fire has a spirit and is here to help us. And by doing that, we can use fire to clean up the land and make our communities safer. And so it's a practice that through colonization has been lost in our communities. But I try not to focus on the loss and focus more on the reclaiming of that knowledge. As, as a child, we were taught to respect fire not to fear it, and we also used it for ceremonies. We used it for uh, 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 offerings to, to, you know, to the, to the spirit world, um, and uh, use it for cooking and warming. So you, you have that connection with it, right? Fire means a lot to me. It was a favorite job that I that I had, and it's definitely a way for myself to kind of connect to my you know, my Métis roots.
By doing something that Métis citizens have been doing basically, you know, since time uh, began in Canada here. There's this uh, idea that in order to be in wildfire management, you need a lot of education, you need to be super fit, you need to have previous experience, you need to know people. But prescribed burning and cultural burning is all about bringing fire back to the community, bringing fire back to the people, and creating that accessibility for all community members to be involved in wildfire management. I think what I'm really hoping to see movement toward is Indigenous-led fire stewardship. So instead of appropriation of our knowledge by agencies, is actually having Indigenous people and like the Métis Nation, for example, being really able to take fire like under us um, and being able to steward our territories in the cultural ways that we see fit. If I had one request from people, the people of Canada, the Métis people, it would be to ensure we have a prescribed fire and firefighting workforce. What is really missing in Canada are the people to join us doing ignitions, doing prescribed fire and firefighting. And so hopefully we can engage with the youth and hopefully we can engage with many people who will want to come out and work with us on the land to do good fire.